So it's great to see you again. Um, as you know, we've been in stealth mode with the Unity Chain. Um, we actually just got back from the PBS uh, Asian Blockchain Summit today. I think I get a lot, pretty, a lot of people there. A lot of people, yeah. yeah. Um, we did want to share just a little bit of an update on what we're doing. We'd like to just keep you and because uh, we're such a huge fan of your work and you know, you know you're a legend. Um, and actually, you're part of the reason why I myself, uh, even though I'm not in power, so I'm not Taiwanese, I'm half our team is, uh, John is, uh, has lived in Taiwan for eight years. Mm. But uh, he was, um, it was essentially in your relationship to the Taiwan future that opened me up to Taiwan. I heard Taiwan never came here before. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when you spoke at uh, Meet Taipei, mm -hmm. the combination of AI and uh, the initiatives and Distributed computing, distributed computing, and the IRP sensors. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, old vision. I'm glad to see that's actually happening. It's uh, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard that uh, Taiwan is doing a big push in identity. Mm -hmm. That's right. So mm -hmm. we've been working on an identity product as well. That yeah. I wanted to, to uh, demo for you. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. And, and Speaking of Vitalik, which is uh, forming a new foundation, or rather the exchange foundation, okay. uh, of which Vitalik and uh, I myself is about those support method. Great. So I guess we're kind of going um, to start co founders then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. Not it's not profit. No, uh, yeah, and, and also Glenn Weil, uh, and also uh, I think uh, Danielle Allen. So the four of us will very soon uh, roll out the regular exchange um, kind of board uh, dialogues. And like that because I think there's a strong push, uh, especially over the past year or so, uh, between the economists such as Glenn Wild that mm -hmm. applies some of the more kind of mutable economics, uh, you know, market design, center design, and so on, uh, to the more traditional economic way in terms of political economy. And right. Vitalik is also himself very interested uh, in that. And so, yeah, I think it's a really good uh, merge between the more traditional political economy fields as yes. well as the more innovative, like coding yes. and distributed ledger innovations. Yeah. yeah. It's a really good purpose. Well, that's, that's wonderful. I would really love to learn more about that. It's, 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 mm -hmm. That's really cool. I'm sure it's going to be uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would love to just give you a quick uh, demo of what we've been working on in self mode. Um, this right. first page is, mm -hmm. and if everything is not fully uh, decentralized here, but a lot of it is, you know, being worked on. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do have a huge emphasis on what we call Unity ID. Okay. And we hope that the Unity ID will be a, kind of like a master account where you can manage your other EIDs, decentralized identities. Yep. Um, and as we, as we know, as we spoke about before, mm -hmm. uh, we plan to, well, already put those in. So I'm going to just make a quick count here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the first step is to check the availability of your actual user. Okay. So one thing about blockchain is, is uh, you know, it traditionally hasn't been actually very usable. Yep. So we're trying to map your alias to your public key. And during this procedure, and of course, it's not a real account, mm -hmm. um, you would be able to connect your Unity ID to your account and be able to log into this application mm -hmm. with your, your email account mm -hmm. or or your DID public key. So this first page here is actually to show your account's available, yeah. your username is available, your ID key is available, and mm -hmm. you actually produce a public private key for you. Okay. Okay, so this first page here, this is actually built in React and HTML CSS. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, so a lot, like very much a work in progress. Um, now, but the idea of this first page is basically a dashboard into, into the into the Unity chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are your assets that you have to do belong on the DLT, perhaps even cross chain assets. We, we intend to do um, interoperability by leveraging um, basically key management and Mm -hmm. So, one thing, the one thing that's special about our network is that we intend to utilize a uh, distributed hash table. And so that means you can have multimedia files. We think a network that has consensus 
with history of storage and also identity um, is, is, is necessary in order to actually do complex smart contracts and to do more interesting things. Um, in addition to uh, decentralized oracles, so oracles are becoming more and more um, important and, and uh, uh, people are realizing that. So suppose that these photos here that you're looking at, these are actually uploaded to, um, what's interesting is you can actually choose if you want this to be uploaded to your drive, to the cloud, or to the distributed hash statement. The key is anything we upload is automatically encrypted in the public, just by default. Right? Um, similarly here, this would be uh, an example of your Google Drive documents. And you know, uh, we would like to figure out the economics in such that we would be able to give new users free, free storage space. Um, this here is just a snapshot of perhaps like a, uh, a perhaps a, once you open this up to the community, the, the development community, someone might make a um, integration with their Fitbit. And maybe someone might be able to track their you know, steps, their sleeping, their weight, any other health related information. The key here, this is actually purely a mock-up, but the key, the key with this here is um, but we want to indicate that applications that are not necessarily blockchain can um, have be blockchain enabled, and primarily it might be through uh, integrations and authentications with identity and accounts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, we have individual assets, so maybe there's different cryptocurrencies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I mentioned earlier that we want to have this to be human readable. Mm -hmm. So uh, the aliases we want to enable to, like suppose that John has an account, I'd like to send John um, some, perhaps some units in our inner in our network card, we call them units. Um, I'd like to send them through his username or his alias. I'd also be able to, we'd like to integrate with uh, Discord or um, Telegram or Riot.io, and it's open source chatting um, platforms, and to be able to actually use his alias to have kind of a encrypted chat with one another, and just to have this all made to the dashboard. Mm -hmm. This here is kind of your profile. This is just the beginning of it. This is where you actually manage what are called your DID documents and things related to your, your identity. So this is installed yet. You can actually see that we have you know, basically some rudimentary beginning of uh, basically your public key, your DID documents, which are more or less uh, different pointers to other things and your other assets that may exist on different different chains. It may not even exist on a chain, but uh, you know, so there's there's a uh, this could be even certifications. This could be a degree. A degree, yeah. Um, the one of the major aspects of what we're doing though is the user owns their data completely. And in fact, you can almost think of this user interface as just a way to organize that data. And we hope that in the future other people can actually scan this. And that once you organize it, it's actually um, can be stored in multiple different databases. Some might be in the cloud, mm -hmm. some might be in your hard drive, some might be elsewhere. But this would be a place where you pull it all together. Um, <clears throat> what we'd like to demonstrate next is, uh, well, I do want to share this here. Right here, notice that these fields are empty. Mm -hmm. And we also have this tab here is called My Preferences. So we, we want to kind of explore this idea of mining your own data. Mm -hmm. being basically take a bunch of personality quizzes, all these different things, and start to get a 360 degree view on your site. Um, in such a way though that we actually don't do the data ourselves. Um, what this ends up doing is it gives you all these data points, right? Um, one thing that we decided we would be really interesting to see is if we could take existing data from like social networks, from your existing fingerprint or footprint online, Amazon purchases, PayPal, et cetera, and then try to pre-populate some of your preference data and your profile data out of that, which would make sense of it. Now, um, we're actually currently working on it right now in this moment, but we have the ability to, it's not working in the demo at this moment, but it was working like last week. Um, <laughs> this is often like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you can actually upload your Facebook JSON file in your profile. Facebook has a lot of information on it. Um, every like you've ever made, every comment you've ever made, it's all recorded, and you can actually download it. So some of it isn't really relevant, but uh, certainly like the fan pages you like, the pages you like, the, the fans, the music, all that stuff that you've liked over the years, it's there. You can actually upload that. So we have this mechanism where you can upload the JSON file. We, we, we basically create a profile out of that information. And you know, um, 
talk to you in a second. It's a little bit personal, but my PayPal history, right? Mm -hmm. I have. I'm glad we're not filming this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not filming this one, guys. <laughs> and I was like, oh, we can't show you guys this one. <laughs> um, but look at this. I got 3,000 records from PayPal in the last seven years, mm -hmm. right? And um, PayPal is actually not very good at data visualization. Mm -hmm. No. No. And then also, this is my Amazon purchases. Not as many, but I have 244 purchases in the last seven years. Okay. okay. Um, this is the type of information we'd like to upload. Uh, you know, you can download it, but you can't really make sense out of a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. But what if you could put this into a graphical kind of pie chart, and mm -hmm. so you can see, like, oh wow, I'm spending a lot of money on Uber. Or whatever it might be, you know? Um, so, uh, well, anyways, the paradigm that we're moving towards, that we want to prepare for, is one bloom in which um, users own their data. Mm -hmm. um, so even to the point where, uh, we would like to have perhaps like a single sign-on into other application websites using your UNI ID mm -hmm. as essentially the master key. As a master key. Mm -hmm. And then the website asks for permission mm -hmm. about what they can access. Kind of like the case about education. But imagine that um, the session is a randomized session ID. And it asks for or automatically I can give my preference data, but just not my personally identifiable data. Mm -hmm. But the is it's okay if you know my favorite color blue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's harmless, mm -hmm. right? So we're just kind of preparing for that kind of world. Um, so as you can see, like identity is really core to what we're doing. Momentarily, I'm going to show you a sample of our test nets. We, have some, we actually got to that point where we have some preliminary data on 650 nodes, mm -hmm. so what amounts to be one chart. But imagine a um, um, imagine this though. Suppose we open open source system, mm -hmm. right? And just so you know, we have the intention to build voting apps, mm -hmm. tools that actual governments might want to use. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, just wanna, we just want to kind of plant that seed to let you know that this is our intention. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up a batch of 50 batches of 1,000 transactions a piece. Mm -hmm. And of course, this isn't exactly a real life scenario. It's, but it is not It is not zero latency, mm -hmm. meaning we do have cell machines that are running virtual machines. Um, so I'm going to generate 50,000 transactions, just prepare them here. Just a little bit of a moment. Now I'm actually going to execute them. So this is running in, in the cloud, mm -hmm. um, but there's about 650 virtual machines running through uh, very close to our design consensus protocol. Mm -hmm. And uh, skip it a little, a little more moments here. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So we got pretty good results. Mm -hmm. um, it's indicating that we've achieved, on average, four thousand four mm -hmm. um, point well, four thousand mm -hmm. transactions per second, um, which actually is a little bit. It is aligned with our research. I mean, in theory, compared to other uh, PBFT or practical platform systems, we have uh, forty to sixty percent less communication over it. Uh, so that's kind of the interesting kind of, uh, you know, the results were already indicating something similar to that. Now, in real life, perhaps this is half, and, and, and like a, you know, actually deployed around the world with, with a global network. Mm -hmm. Even if it's one fourth, mm -hmm. we're talking about steady 1,000 transactions per second. So, and we feel like we're moving into this era, you know, refer to Libra, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, their kind of model. Our system has some similarities to their design. Um, and yeah, we're just, we just wanted to, we'd, we'd love to keep you updated every three or four months on our What do you mean the similarities? Do you mean that you're compatible issues that move language? Or oh, so, move language. so yeah, that's very interesting. Um, we're actually in the stage where, so everything's written in whole language now for, our, for us. Now, um, I think we should say move. I've heard really good things yeah. about it. And like, I started reading so much. There's just so much virtual machine. Yeah. yeah. It's like the language is still digital. Yeah. Are you looking at it now? Yeah. Yeah. I'm making a language. Like everyone is <laughs> on it. Like, yeah. Of course. Everyone is on it. Trying to be in the science. It's like, that. It seems pretty solid. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, uh, as I was actually referring to the fact that they have a BFT algorithm. Mm. Uh, deeper concept of BFT. We call our Unity BFT. Okay. Um, and what's interesting, and this is we're still kind of as a team wrapping our head around it, but. Like PBFT and Libre BFT, I believe, is three rounds of communication. 
Is that correct? Uh, Three phases. Three phases. Yeah. Is the three phase for three phase for a yeah. So two round like three phases for two rounds voting. Mm -hmm. So one voting means you have to like aggregate the majority yes. for two times. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Different phases. Um, ours is kind of a strange frequent major type of design in that it's it's I guess it's one point five rounds. So one round of aggregation and one round of broadcasting proof. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we think, um, you know, uh, we've been studying it deeply the last eight months, other protocols, and kind of verifying our own approach. Mm -hmm. We think it's interesting, um, and the results are, you know, it's still very early. So we hope that we can produce a public chain that's actually active, maybe sometimes we're going to it. So we're basically, we know that it takes time. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the demo we wanted to share with you, keep you up to date about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So we're a shortage protocol, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so what's interesting is that most uh, public chains are, are benefiting higher TPS or lower, or a smaller amount of nodes, right? Um, the problem is that with, when you want to solve the trilemma of speed, uh, security, decentralization, you um, you basically ignore decentralization. That's right. Our system. Uh, actually uses more nodes mm. in order to be to solve this trilemma. Um, so our shard is actually larger. It's like 600, 600 to 700 nodes. Um, and we use forums and groups of, of consensus mm. of, of around 70 that are choose, uh, chosen randomly. Mm. We have, I think we mentioned this last time, but we have different, um, we have a non-deterministic random number uh, uh, and a deterministic random, a general random number generation. So, um, we believe that our our approach could solve maybe be close to solve this problem, and uh, you know our vision really is to make it more decentralized and uh, lower the participation to become a node. We want millions of nodes. We actually want this to be so human, such a a peer to peer network that people don't really have to stake ten thousand dollars, a thousand dollars to be a part of it. Mm. and to contribute to this new global computer. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of the vision. That's our core. Mm -hmm. You know, blockchain, like, at least in my vision, I'm very into blockchain, mm -hmm. that's our business. The blockchain, at least in my opinion, so was born as a way to overcome the obstacles of finance today, regular finance today, so the hack is that that wealth is not distributed. It has to be concentrated, like the richer, get richer. Mm -hmm. That's how it works, and it is very easy to make transactions with countries that are less rich. I'm an expert here, and uh, it's also extremely, extremely difficult to make transactions with my country. Mm -hmm. So if I want to pay my rent, as of today, I cannot do that with my own bank account mm -hmm. in Italy. Mm -hmm. So I think that blockchain was born somehow as a solution to overcome the obstacles of third party regular finance, but then on the other hand, solutions like Google Board and Google Stay put more obstacles to that because in order to participate in a network that is based on even Google Stay and Google Board, you need the money, right? Whether it is electricity, a big computer, or actual money for Google Stay, you need the money. So where is the purpose of blockchain? Mm -hmm. So uh, what I really believe in is our purpose of really putting something in place to overcome this, to actually reach out for the people that will benefit from blockchain. Because the rich countries will definitely benefit from blockchain, but not, not even close to the extent which countries like for example just the Philippines will benefit from it. So I really believe in this as, as a solution to overstep the obstacles put by the people working on the mm -hmm. So, um so that's why our focus is on a decentralized identity. Our focus is kind of bridging your real identity, maybe with your digital identity. Mm. And in that way, um, in our system, we can try to make it so it's one person, one node, and one vote. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. To solve maybe civil systems. Mm -hmm. So we really want to make our network um, like a peer-to-peer -peer democratic. Yes. Uh, 
<laughs> and actually doing this sort of deep dive on the idea uh, he's going to be presenting it and speaking about it at yeah it was up Oh, yeah. 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 So, um, so we have a chat. We have a chat on, on, on blockchain. So, of course, um, we have every type of kinds of talk topics this time, and I'm really pleasant to present Yunlin as researcher, as core researcher, to talk about uh, decentralized identity. And actually, I wonder, uh, from your opinion, uh, what do you think about the self 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 sovereign identity and so on? Um, Recently, I've been studying this topic for a while, um, and it, to be honest, it's really like the resources and the research is like really distributed. Like, there's no single organization that you can find all the information. So, like, um, it's pretty uh, distributed and it's really hard putting every pieces together. Um, so, so far, I know yes. So, blockchain is a uh, it's the last piece of puzzle that. Can, uh, the self serving sovereign identity. Why? Because for, for now we use Google and Facebook, right? And these social accounts can somehow represent our identity right now. So we can use the same account to log in uh, different websites. But your identity is, is still controlled by the central services. Mm -hmm. That means, well, you cannot really own your data, your data is owned by someone else, and you cannot always retrieve the data anytime you want. And you have the, uh, the risk of Exposing your privacy, for example, like you're you're getting advertised every time, even you don't you don't want it. Like you keep, yeah, because you keep looking the YouTube advertisements, selling your personal data to 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 put in the uh, ads. Uh, so the blockchain is actually the last piece for. Uh, so the, the, it's a layer for you to anchor mm -hmm. um, your identity so that you can, well, the, because you use a digital signature, right? So. The one who owns the private key owns the identity. Mm -hmm. So thanks for the crypto, uh, cryptography. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, what do you think about what 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 should be the tags that government can take mm -hmm. to uh, adopt this is I mm -hmm. Yeah. So a few things. Um, so the government uh, of Taiwan, of course, has uh, embraced the PKI based yes. model for for years, essentially, and we did talk yes. about it. Uh, but one uh, core issue of a PKI-based um, transaction model uh, is the form factor that it is delivered. At the moment, it is in the form of a separate plastic card mm -hmm. called yeah. the, the digital citizen card or the CDC. Uh, and the problem with that card is first that only maybe one in five persons, or now I think it's close to one in four, um, actively use the card. Uh, and the second is that the form factor, although it's NFC enabled in the last couple of years, um, I think most people still use it as IC card form, mm -hmm. uh, which is very bulky and uh, frankly not very mobile friendly. Um, and so while the PKI is pretty solid uh, and people generally trust it, uh, the usage is kind of low, and even when people file their taxes online, or when they, for example, take um, a, their um, airplane tickets to, yeah. to fly domestic and so on, they tend to use the non PKI card, which is the healthcare card uh, in, in Taiwan, and which actually creates a kind of anti right? Uh You just want to get your uh, plane tickets, why should you trust the, the airline to have access to your health? Uh, um, Card, which they can theoretically also write into it, right? Uh, and then trust them in exchange for a ticket. Well, because everybody has a healthcare card, and not many people have a uh, PKI card, which is why the airlines invest in the health card uh, reading machines rather than the uh, proper PKI reading machine, which would enable much more fine grained uh, control and uh, signatures and things like that. So. I think um, the government's uh, role in this regard is simply to create more compelling use cases uh, for the NFC-enabled PKI card. Uh, for example, um, in uh, democracy, it's actually a pretty good one because people often would want to join uh, e-signatures on referendums. That is actually one compelling use case uh, for a PKI this card because it need to carry the same uh, strengths as a signature. Uh, but people, you know, really need a lot of signatures, so it's a lot of uh, time for a 
person running referendum to go and collect this paper based signatures. Uh, but the healthcare card, of course, cannot be used as referendum. People generally think it's not the norm, right? And so I, I think just the referendum uh, signature cases alone uh, is a pretty good convincing case for people to essentially um, have an app of some sort and use it and it's enabled to get a card and beat it and enter a password uh, and to join the, the e signature. I think that would get people accustomed. Uh, to the use of the care card pretty quickly, and that's what our CEC our central uh, election committee is now. I think they've finished the development, so you're just uh, waiting for cybersecurity audits uh, at the moment. And so I think the government's role is just to con create compelling use cases. So, uh, what's the so any what we can we can we find further information about the case you're describing? Yeah, I, I think the CEC is, is under cybersecurity review, although we're not particularly yes, rush the central ele election committee. Uh, right. So, so it's just a referendum uh, e petition or e signature system. Okay. Okay. So it's currently under cyber security okay. review, uh, but we're, we're under no time constraint though because uh, the referendum and the elections are not alternating years, and this is so that the referendum can uh, commence in a way that is more conversational, uh, a more of a dialogue between different positions rather than kind of a showdown between the opposing parties, which is what always happens if you time it exactly in the same day as election, right? Uh, it, it tends to be hijacked by party politics. And so now we're moving to a kind of uh, odd and even, uh, even number of years. There's far more time for people to have a real discussion among the people who join the e-petition or e-signature and the referendum that is falling you know, on the years between major elections. And so we'll at least have one, one more year. Uh, to have this kind of conversation and also get people into the habit of join, join, uh, yes. joining a, a, a signature petition using uh, the referendum uh, PPI system. So I think the rollout with luck uh, will be around the um, end of this year. Uh, but once that happens, then it's one of the most convincing uh, use cases for PPI. I think that's brilliant. I think it's really useful. I feel like uh, I've heard, even myself, I don't even have any type of just a couple of people have asked me, did you sign this like, like petition? It's yeah. And uh, uh, like having a verifiable signature, it proves that these are real people. You know, exactly. And you can not tamper with the results. Yeah. Like, imagine like how many elections were tampered with, oh, yeah. and another candidate suddenly won. You yes. cannot tamper with the result. That is it. People yeah. said yes. It's yes. It's yes. yes. that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's amazing. So do you think uh, in the near future the how many staff election, the presidential election will be on and on blockchain? Or? Well, we'll we'll try it on referendum first because referendum has the dual property of uh, you know you're you're basically voting on uh, issues, not people. So it doesn't have the same exponential return if you hijack it. Right. If you hijack one particular referendum, either socially or through cybersecurity means, or invalidate the vote, the, the most you can lose is just the social energy spend on campaigning for that particular issue. But if you hijack a, a election for the president, well, the return is exponential. Yeah. Right? Because the president can effectively change regulations. So we're, we're probably going to try it a few times on, uh, you know, uh, participatory budgeting, uh, on referendums, on things that are binding but not people, yes. before we can roll anything out to people. Um, it's the same uh, for like electronic tallying or for people to vote uh, uh, outside of their district's voting booth. Uh, there's many people which will work in a different district uh, as compared to where they are registered or where, where they live, right? Uh, and even people who are overseas. Uh, and people who vote for referendums, or especially national referendum, it doesn't really matter because it's the same set of issues. Uh, and, and if we do it electronic tallying, we can also render a sample to make sure that it's the same as you know, a manual tally. But however, if you're the only person who lives in another school district out of your, from your like, indigenous district or something, and you vote for a person uh, back in your district, then you're actually your ticket when it's counted, no matter via paper or, or, or not, is going to be the only vote in that district, uh, and, and that's targeting another district. And so it, it makes um, a, a lot more security guarantees necessary to make sure that uh, it doesn't get re-identified and such. So for national referendums, all these things are not a problem. So that's where we're trying it out first in the uh, upcoming uh, national referendum. I think it's uh, two years or so from now. Uh, that's great. I can see that uh, if that goes well, 
very quickly in right. succession that they'll be open to a lot of exactly. Exactly. That's great, which is awesome. And also the citizen digital certificate, there's an ADMS version as well. Yeah. So the, the ACDC. Yeah. Uh, it's not very well known, it's not very popular, but uh, it's there. So if you want to try it out, you can, you can still get a copy and get access to your PKI system as offered by the And another thing I'm quite interested in was um, I've been discussing similar topic back at home with my family. And do you see the voting me mechanism in this space for referendums mm -hmm. change immediately mm -hmm. and completely? Mm -hmm. So it will be digital on um, PKI and so on and so forth immediately, or there will be like a double. Well, even for here. Estonia, uh, I think they use it for advanced voting. Mm -hmm. So you can use your PKI to kind of override your votes uh, within a period of time. And it's a good idea because you may be coerced, right? At any given time, there's no way for the Italian software to know that you're not being coerced. Yes. So the social solution is that you can always go back home and then override your own vote. Okay. And then you can go to the voting booth to vote by paper to override all your electronic votes. Uh, and so it's a way to kind of socially, uh, you still have the last line of defense. Okay. Like if you were coerced in it, you know, during the vote or whatever, you can always go and override uh, that particular vote. So, okay. so I think that kind of hybrid system is perhaps what we're looking at as a, as a social problem. Thank you. Um, is there anything else that uh, Tamo is doing in the blockchain or AI mm -hmm. or, uh, arena that's super interesting to you these days? Uh, yeah. Well, we have a presidential hackathon, uh, and we okay. just uh, had our cohort of 20 selected to the top 10. And so it's a really interesting endeavor because while it's not directly like must be AI oriented or blockchain oriented. Uh, there are several cases where they do use machine learning uh, technology to massively simplify uh, people's lives. Like last year, one of the five million teams uh, is using machine learning to detect water pipe leakage early. Uh, so that's the people who repair um, and very quickly gets the idea of where things are leaking around them instead of just keep hearing the same pipes that it's not really leaking. And we uh, actually sent that team to Wellington, to New Zealand last year, to cohort for another three months after the presidential hackathon to help them also narrowing down the what type leakage issues. So this time, yeah, if you could go to the presidential hackathon website, you can see the, the top 10 cases, and many of them use machine learning in very creative ways. So because the, the contest is still ongoing, we still don't have the five finalists, that's another month. So I can't really mention any which one and the, <laughs> the jury here. <laughs> but uh, I would just say all the 10 uh, cases are really, really good. And when the president, uh, Dr. Tsai uh, saw the demo, she thinks all the 20 was so good that she asked me uh, to keep uh, seeing that the, the bottom 10 <laughs> uh, still gets uh, to fruition uh, because there's some really, really good ideas there. Yeah, right. So the top five actually, they, they don't get any money. They get a, a trophy. And the trophy is a projector that when turned on shows the president handing the team a trophy. So it's very meta. Uh, <laughs> and it symbolizes the presidential promise that whatever it takes, uh, the three months prototype delivered will be part of the public service in the next year. Right. So it's the, the presidential will, the presidential mandate. So yeah, maybe next year if you're around, you can. I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear from you and mm -hmm. I always uh, feel re-inspired mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you're taking your time. Mm -hmm. and, but maybe we can, uh, we'll schedule another meeting in four months yeah. or three or four months. Yeah. Look, looking very much forward to it. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.